All right, so uh, today we're all about time series databases and using Facebook's profit, Facebook profit to create a variant time series forecast. Um, and this talk will go from the macro, just we'll start off kind of asking ourselves this time series, um, why do you need a time series database? Then I'll introduce uh, InfluxDB and how it can help you um, to handle your time series data. And then we'll actually start talking about why it is that you might want to use Facebook Profit, the advantages of Facebook Profit, why it was built. Then we'll talk a little bit about um, how it works. And then finally, I'll demonstrate to you how you can write data to InfluxDB and then how you can use the Python client to query your data and create a simple prediction. I do want to specify that um, this data set and the example is uh, largely replicated from the quick start example from the Facebook profit repo. So um, if you want to find that work and that you can look there as well for it. Um, and I won't be uh, demonstrating too much of the nitty gritty about Facebook profit, but luckily this whole meetup is organized so well that in the next talk we'll get to learn more. Um, so yeah, I'm really excited about that. Um, So a little bit about me, I, uh, as I mentioned, I'm a developer advocate at Influx Data. For those of you who don't know what a developer advocate is, it's someone who tries to represent the community to the company and the company to the community. So I spend a lot of my time creating blogs, tutorials, uh, proof of concepts, um, giving talks, um, getting, uh, answering community questions, taking product feedback, giving it back to product, um, and also demonstrating and sharing the work that engineers do, um, which is actually probably part of my favorite part of my job, just because I, I like to like have the opportunity to give uh, these awesome engineers the, the sort of the publicity that they deserve and like highlight their work. Uh, that's even though I didn't do it, so <laughs> I get to share it with everybody and kind of get to brag for them. So uh, yeah, um, and then uh, if you want to follow me on LinkedIn. Um, my parents actually gave me five names, so that's what I stuck with on LinkedIn. So Ana East Jackie Dotis on LinkedIn, and then my Twitter is Ana East Dotis. So let's just start from the beginning. What is a time series? Um, it's probably what you think it is or, or what you might already know that it is, which is just a series of data points that are indexed in time. And so common examples include things like, like weather or stock prices, but the reality is, is that time series data exists absolutely everywhere. Um, there might be something sort of like philosophical about that um, and something to do with space time, but I'm not gonna go that deep. But basically we find, we find time series everywhere. We think about IoT monitoring and we think about software teams who are expected to like move more quickly and um, test more frequently and release more frequently and test earlier and improve the quality of their code um, and uh, so they need to do things like be able to collect a whole bunch of metrics on their machine, on their machines, their VMs, um, their containers. Um, they need to be able to look at system stats. They might need to be able to track third party integrations. They might need to perform application monitoring. They might need to monitor um, their CI CD pipelines. So, um, sorry, I talked about, yeah. So, DevOps monitoring is like obviously a huge huge source of time series data. And being able to have visibility into the health of your systems is what enables uh, organizations to uphold uh, their SLAs, right? And then when we think about IoT monitoring, I went in reverse, but when we think of IoT monitoring and we think about the fact that there are gonna be, what is it? I think it's like 25 billion IoT devices active IoT devices by 2025. I mean, that's insane amount of devices. And when I think IoT, I mostly think sensors and sensors monitor our physical environment. And so all of that data is also time series data. Um, but time series isn't just limited to IoT monitoring and DevOps monitoring. It also exists in business analytics, in FinTech is a huge source, um, also in biotech and healthcare and agriculture and retail. It's, it's pretty much everywhere. So you need a special way to collect, store, analyze, and visualize time series data. 
because the way that people interact with time series data is is fairly unique. Um, when we think about time series data, we're either concerned with what's happening in the present and we need to collect it in real time and act on it in real time, in which case we need a method or an agent that will be able to collect data from sensors or hosts or containers efficient, efficiently. Um, and we also need to be able to store that massive amount of data in a database that's optimized to handle really, really high ingest rates and really high query loads. And so you need some sort of time series database for that. Also time series databases in general, um, they typically have integrated features which allow you to downsample your data because it's pretty rare that we want to retain uh, the full precision of our data for a long period of time. So we need, we need some sort of feature that exists like that. Or we might even just decide that after a certain amount of time, this data isn't even useful to us anymore and we need a way to automatically expire it. Um, also, when you think about um, observability and visualization of your time series data, you need to be able to have access to a visualization library that incorporates algorithms that allow you to plot hundreds of thousands of time series data points um, in a fast and efficient manner um, and that will render those visualizations quickly. So uh, you need not only specialized collection agents databases, but also specialized um, dashboarding capabilities and visualization. So I will introduce uh, InfluxDB just briefly. InfluxDB is uh, Influx Data's main plat monitoring platform. And it consists of two components, Telegraph and InfluxDB. Telegraph is a collection agent. It's written in Go, and it's plugin driven. And it's database agnostic. Um, so with a single config, you can gather data from a variety of different sources and send that to any database of your choice. Well, not any, but there's a lot of different outputs. So if you are just simply looking to collect data and you don't know how um, and you don't you can't think of a good way to do it, I highly recommend checking out in, uh, Telegraph um, because it's also open sourced. And so is InfluxDB. And InfluxDB is a purpose-built database a visualization, and a query and task engine. So you can create alerts and notifications. You can um, create tasks which will run various queries or user-defined functions on your time series um, at scheduled, uh, scheduled times. Um, and you can downsample your data or, I don't know, create custom anomaly detection algorithms and apply them um, periodically. So now let's talk about profit and what it is, why it was created, and what it aims to achieve. So profit was basically created because time series forecasting is hard. Um, to completely automate forecasting techniques is very challenging. Um, and also a lot of traditional forecasting techniques um, and statistical techniques or even uh, neural nets are difficult to tune or they're oftentimes too inflexible to incorporate um, useful assumptions or deep domain expertise. So Profit aimed to first address that problem. They wanted to make, Facebook wanted to make a time series forecasting library that would be flexible and easy to tune. And then the second is that time series data is extremely unique. Um, and it's unique because it exhibits this property called autocorrelation, which means that one portion of time series is oftentimes correlated to another portion of itself at a previous time. So that's kind of the definition of seasonality from a math perspective. In other words, like um, if we think about sales, the sales on one given Friday will probably mirror the, the same sales on another Friday. Um, and this feature of time series uh, makes it especially tricky to determine what sort of algorithms you should use for forecasting. It makes it really hard to also evaluate 
the um, prediction accuracy of your model. Because for other models, for um, when you try and like predict class, for example, you might be able to um, use linear regression um, to make sort of predictions. But um, you can't actually use linear regression and then use like uh, the RSME or the like the distance between the, the, the residuals between your, your prediction and a linear regression um, to model your prediction accuracy because um, basically linear regression assumes that your data doesn't have correlation. So you can't actually even use that with time series. So my whole point is that time series is like very different type of data and a lot of data scientists might not have specific training in time series. And so Profit wanted to help data science, data scientists and data science departments and organization have access to um, forecasting algorithm without having to necessarily have this deep domain, domain expertise. Um, and finally, what Facebook Profit aims to achieve is that because it's easy, the idea is that a lot of people will be able to use it. And secondly, um, it allows you to handle idiosyncratic features. And what I mean by that is that a lot of statistical forecasting algorithms re require that your data is a regular time series, meaning that the interval between each point, each time series point that you get is equal. But the reality of the situation is that life is messy and that we don't typically have data that's that clean. And so in order to apply um, a lot of other statistical forecasting methods that depend on the assumption that you have regularly time, regularly spaced time series, is you need to do a data preparation step beforehand and perform some type of interpolation so that you can um, convert your regular time series into a regular one. And Facebook Profit is, just eliminates that requirement or that step. So that's another way in which it makes it easier. And um, just by contrast, um, some, some algorithms that require that you have regular time series include things like ARIMA or uh, triple exponential smoothing, um, just to name a few in case those ring a bell. So now let's uh, briefly talk about how Facebook Profit works. So in essence, it's very similar to um, double or, or really triple exponential smoothing in that it takes the regressors of the time series, in other words, the sort of dependent parts of a time series, and it separates them out, the different components of a time series, and then creates predictions for them independently, and then sums them back all up together and to produce your forecast. So, the formula is briefly described as uh, y of t, which is our prediction, equals to g of t, which represents um, little piecewise or linear or logistic parts of our time series, plus the seasonality pattern, s of t, plus h of t, which are any holidays that are given by the user. Um, so for example, if you were looking at sales, maybe uh, you, know, you might include holidays you know, like Thanksgiving and Christmas, et cetera. And then finally, the residuals. And the residuals are just, um, if you have your original time series and you separate away basically the uh, linear logistic growth, growth, so the trend, and you separate the seasonality and you separate your holidays, whatever you're left with. So basically kind of noise um, or errors. Um, so it incorporates all these four elements, makes individual predictions, adds them back up together, and that's how you get your um, prediction. So today I will be teaching you how it is that we can set up Telegraph to write some of our data into InfluxDB. And then we will use the Python client to uh, query our database. And then we will convert that data into a data frame. And finally, we will make a forecast with Facebook Profit. So the very first step we need in order to use Telegraph 
um, once you've installed it. Uh, also, Telegraph and InfluxDB, they install as a single binary. Um, so once you have installed it, you need to gather some parameters. And you also need to gather these parameters um, not only for Telegraph to write data to Influx, but also um, so that you can use the Python client to query data from your instance. And these include gathering your, uh, what is known as your bucket, your token, and your organization. And so this is a view of the InfluxDB UI um, under the load data tab. And you can see we have all of our, all of our information there. Um, a bucket is basically where you write your data to. Um, and then the organization is the organization that you set up, um, which uh, is multi-tenant. And uh, so, yeah, it's just your organization. Um, and let's see. So yeah, that's where you'd find all those variables um, or all that information. Or alternatively, you could also use um, the CLI to find that. But to run Telegraph, all you do, the first step is to generate a config. And the way that you do that is you uh, specify Telegraph, and then you um, use the input filter um, to specify which plugin you want as your input. And we're going to be using the file plugin. And then you also want to specify your output filter, which will be InfluxDB v2. And then you use the config flag and to specify where you want this config to go, and you store it into the um, configuration file of your choice, which I'm naming uh, profit underscore data .com. And then we run Influx, um, the CLI, and we can pass in our token and our org name and use the bucket find command to actually find our buckets as well this way. So that's just another fun fact. Um, and then to actually run our Telegraph config, we simply pass in uh, our uh, profit underscore data dot conf um, with the uh, config flag dash dash config. So this is what a Telegraph config looks like. Um, it's pretty simple. Uh, if you want to write data to Influx, you simply need to have to specify the URL where Influx is running, you need to provide your token, your organization, and your bucket. Um, and then, uh, actually, I'm missing a slide, I just realized. But in order to, to write the data, the input portion of the, the config, you simply spe specify the the pathway to where your um, CSV lives, and then it can write that data from, from CSV since I was using the file input plugin. Well, let's just move on to Python because that's what we're here for, right? Um, so the very first step uh, to use the, the InfluxDB Python client is to first import our packages. And so we will import our InfluxDB client. Um, we'll also make sure that we have imported pandas um, and we might want to specify the right option for the client as well. And in this case, I will be making my rights synchronously, but you can also make asynchronous rights. And um, after I've gotten um, my authorization parameters um, and I've stored them in a variable called token, and I also have my URL, and I also have my bucket ID, I um, can now simply uh, just instantiate the client. And then the next thing I need to do is to generate a query with Flux. And Flux is Influx Data's um, scripting language um, designed for querying and analyzing and acting on data. Um, so this query uh, is, I'm storing it in the variable query, and it looks like the following. I specify from bucket, the bucket that I'm writing my data to, which is Facebook profit. Oh. Um, and then I specify the range from which I want to query my data from. And then I'm going to specify uh, the filters that I want to filter for. And my data set is actually going to be 
um, page views on a Wikipedia article of Peyton Manning, um, who is a football player, and I don't remember for which team, uh, but I probably should know that, but I'm not a huge football uh, fan. So apologies in advance. I guess I'm not a good Texan. Um, anyways, uh, and then, um, so I'm gonna filter for the, uh, the views, which is my measurement, and the field, which is Y. And I chose the field of Y because um, that's actually what is required to be the column name of the value or the of the value that you want to make a forecast on in your data frame when you use Facebook profit. So that's why I wrote uh, my time series data with that um, field name. And then I can return uh, the results um, after I use the, the query uh, method where I supply uh, my organization and my query. And I will store those results in the variable results. And I just wanted to show you um, sort of what that data looks like raw, um, just so that you know how I'll kind of have a preview into how the client works. Um, but I actually don't recommend iterating through the tables um, and looking at the data this way because there is a query get data frame method uh, as a part of the client that you can just return the data as a data frame directly. But I did want to share with you what the raw results look like because it is something that's kind of unique to Influx in that Influx stores all of the time series data based off of a group key and splits the data sort of into tables. So even though InfluxDB is NoSQL, it has this almost like table relational feel and Flux allows you to interact with the data um, in a very similar feeling. And so you can perform things like joins, um, you can do math across measurements, and you can perform, perform complicated groups. Um, and so that's kind of why I just wanted to, to kind of demonstrate like the raw results from the client. Which of course we could convert into a data frame like so, but the way that I really recommend doing it is that if, for example, instead we were, let's say, querying some system stats, then um, we can simply use the query underscore data underscore frame method of the query API and return our data directly into a data frame. So um, yeah, that's what I would actually recommend. And then you can use a uh, pandas data frame head function to return the first n number of rows or five number of rows. So now let's get into how it is that we'd make a forecast with Facebook profit. So profit really can't uh, couldn't be more simple. <laughs> um, so we start off by just instantiating a new Facebook profit object. And any settings that you want to put into your forecasting procedure would be passed into that constructor. So if you want to add things like holidays, um, if you want to add saturation limits or maximums and minimums, you can do that. So what I mean by that is if you know that your um, system is bound by physical limitations, like maybe you're in a chemical plant and you're looking at a heat exchanger and you know if the temperature, you know, if it exceeds a certain amount, um, you're gonna have some sort of, or it can't exceed a certain amount because like, just the, because of the system itself, then you can include the saturation limits. Um, so that's another thing that you can, another feature of profit that you can take advantage of, for example. So yeah, you fit um, any of your uh, forecasting settings into the constructor. And then um, you call the fit method on your data frame. Um, and this is our actual data that looks like uh, the page views. So the left-hand column here are the page views and DS is the date. And um, 
DS is actually what you need to name the time column of your pandas data frame. And so once you fit, uh, once you make the fit, and fitting doesn't take very long, like just a couple seconds, um, then you need to create a future data frame so that you have a data frame with empty rows so that you can actually make a forecast onto that data frame. And so you use the make underscore future underscore data frame method and you pass in the number of periods that you want to be able to extend your data frame to. And so if we, um, Sorry, let me go back a second. So actually, if we look, I made a mistake. I'm so sorry. I'm feeling silly. So if we look at the, the left-hand column, that's actually just the index. And we can see that we don't have any y values because it's empty, because we just extended the dates out into the future, but we don't actually have any future forecast. So now we're able to actually like make a forecast onto this empty data frame. Um, and maybe it would help if I show you real quick like what our data originally looked like. Um, so our original data is the pink line um, with daily views and uh, the field is, is Y. Um, and so now we can simply call the predict method on our future data frame and it will assign each row in the future data frame a predicted value. Um, and it names that predicted value y hat, and it also supplies confidence intervals y hat, y lower, which you can also um, change the confidence uh, interval level if you choose, as well as um, other statistical aspects about your forecast and about your fit. Um, and so then we can use the Python client to write our data to InfluxDB. Um, and I'm actually running out of time, so I will not, I will skip that, but basically all you need to do, I'll just like briefly describe it. Um, so instead, um, when you wanna write, it would look like a client dot write underscore api dot write record equal and then you pass your data frame in as your record and that's how you write your data to InfluxDB. and you also specify the bucket that you want to write your data to um, as well as your measurement and that's all that you need to do um, So yeah, I wanted to also mention some other things that Profit can do. I recommend just taking a look at the documentation because it can do a bunch of different things. Like I said, you can add holidays, you can create saturation thresholds, you can also adjust the change point prior scale. So what that means is that um, when Facebook is trying to kind of map out the linear and logistic trends of your um, time series, uh, it will sample uh, time series at a different scale. So you can either say like make a lot, take a lot of samples or fewer samples. Um, and that will kind of essentially have the effect of like making your um, forecast like smoother or not. Um, so that's another really useful tool. And then you can also add multiple regressors to your time series as well. Um, and the way you do that is you simply add another column. So if you had your Y column in your data frame that has your actual values, you would have another column that would just be your, be your regressors. Um, I believe that's how you do it. And then you can make the fit. Um, as long as you're predicted, the, the values that when you, you wanna predict on has the column name Y, then you're good. Um, and then I wanted to talk a little bit about the the Python client and address a question that I get a lot, which is like um, whether or not machine learning needs to be carried out server side. And um, I 
I just wanted to, my, my opinion is that it doesn't for two reasons. One is that um, Python client, this Python client can, is extremely performant. You can query like uh, 4.6 million points in 21 seconds. I did it on my machine with other processes running, not with the same benchmark conditions. And I was able to query over a million points in like 12 seconds. Um, so yeah, it's really fast. And then secondly, I think just in terms of thinking about like what's the best way to maybe execute or apply machine learning in production, um, I think it makes sense to pull your data out of your time series database in general, because time series databases should really be considered more of a time series data lake, whereas um, when you want to apply machine learning, you might want to do that um, in a data warehouse and isolate those workloads. Um, I will say some disadvantages coming back, because I talked a lot about the advantages of profit, but some disadvantages include that in order to make a successful forecast, you need to forecast the entire, you need to have an entire cycle, uh, ideally. And so that can be a lot of data. Um, like in, in contrast, an advantage of using a neural network is that you might be able to save the weights and perform incremental training, um, which could be a lot more lightweight. So I think those are just some of the, the pros and cons, but I'm, here, I'm sure we'll learn a lot more about um, how to use Facebook Profit in production. Um, but I will say that uh, if you're gonna only perform univariate time series forecasting, then you definitely wanna use the statistical method because they, they outperform um, neural networks in terms of prediction accuracy. Uh, and then here are some resources, um, some, some examples for using LSTM, for using Keras. Um, and then also if you have questions about time series and time series forecasting, I encourage you to go to um, our community uh, channel, community.influxdata.com uh, and ask me any questions you have, I'd be happy to to talk and, and exchange ideas. We also have a Slack channel. Um, and then here are some more resources for um, some differences in, in, some, in some basic data science tools in the Python client. Um, thank you. <laughs> Actually, I can't hear you. Oh, sorry. Yeah, my mic was muted. Yeah, it's th thanks for pointing that out. Can we please give Anahisa a round of applause in the chat? I just posted in my uh, my clap emojis. That was fantastic. Uh, uh, we do actually have some questions. Uh, so the first question is, what kind of dimensionality can uh, InfluxDB handle? Dimensionality? Yes. Um, so... You can have, I, I wondering if that's the same, if you're asking the same thing as like series cardinality. Um, uh, so you can have a huge amount of different time series um, ingest capabilities. I think I have some silly slide that feels very marketing-y in here. Um, doo -doo 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 -doo. So if you have like, a, a series cardinality of, of 10,000, then um, you can have um, over 700,000, right, over 700,000 points per second. Um, if we're thinking about dimensionality, um, it's it's really up to you and what your time series looks like. Um, yeah. <laughs> awesome, so we do have another question. How do you choose periods? Is there something that you do maybe observe them visually and then try it with a specific setting? So like maybe like a trial and error type thing? Um, so I, I think a lot of people uh, like to see if they can, visualizing their data always has a lot of value, but a typical approach someone might have to automatically detecting um, seasonality in their time series data is to create an autocorrelation plot and then um, maybe use Pearson's correlation coefficient on that plot to determine whether or not you have, that's like a quantitative way of determining whether or not you have seasonality. 
Okay, cool. And also, uh, you were mentioning that uh, Facebook Profit can handle holidays. Can it also treat intraday times as special? I can. You can also develop schedules too, where you can prioritize and increase the weights of, during certain periods of the time of of your day. So if you know that you know you know operational hours are from eight eight to five, then maybe that data gets uh, more of a weight, and you can tell Profit to kind of ignore the data outside of particular times. Okay, awesome. And uh, so you were talking a little bit about like the workflow of uh, setting up like uh, InfluxDB and how people use it. So what's sort of just like, is is it deployed out using like a cloud service or do people install like their own version? Like how do people manage InfluxDB? Yeah, so we have a fully managed cloud service with a free tier as well that's scalable and elastic, um, but there's also the open source version. So sometimes like if you think about IoT application developers, they might be using a combination of both where maybe they're doing some IoT processing at, at the edge. Maybe they're even using um, the StumpI at, at the edge too, for example, and then um, maybe sending uh, aggregated our data back to to influx and storing all their all their data there, so it can be a combination. Okay, cool. Uh, I think that's it for all the questions. Can we please give Anahis another round of applause in the chat? Uh, before we do let you go, do you have any action items or uh, words of wisdom for our community? Words of wisdom: Stay curious. <laughs> I like that. Uh, is there anything you're curious about at the moment? So just to pry a little bit. Um, I'm actually, I'm super excited about this talk today because I have been reading a lot about um, Stumpy or Stumpy. I'm actually, I'm sorry, I don't know the right pronunciation, but um, I'm super excited about it. I've been spending my whole like week learning and reading about it. So that's what, yeah, that's what I'm been into. <laughs> awesome. I like that. Well, I'm glad that, uh, I'm glad you're excited about this talk. Your talk was fantastic. And thanks again for uh, for joining our live stream. Thank you so much for having me.